I want to reiterate a couple of things that we mentioned on Sunday uh, in our new series that we started on encounters. And um, got a really good feedback from people that appreciated the, the thought that I shared that there's a huge difference between having an experience with God and encountering him. And so I want to build on that a little bit tonight and uh, take a look at the, what we referenced. We didn't really develop it, um, but the, the uh, account in John chapter 5 of the healing uh, of the man at the pool of Bethesda. And uh, so we'll take a look at that. And then if you want to turn to uh, 2 Corinthians 3, we'll, we'll kind of use that to bring it together. And I'll just share with you a couple of key points before we go back into prayer. Sound good? All right, here we go. Um, here, here's the, the big idea is encountering God, seeing him face to face. Exactly what we were singing about tonight. Good job with worship, by the way. Um, it's a dangerous prayer and a dangerous request because we, we don't understand how... Um, incredible the, the presence and glory of God really is. And that to, to make the request is one thing and it can be selfish in that motivation to begin with. And particularly as we talk about prayer, I think one of the biggest deceptions um, that we, we wrestle with uh, is or I should say misunderstandings. It can be a deception. One of the biggest understandings, misunderstandings when it comes to prayer is that when we, we pray for things, we have a tendency to uh, pray toward experience rather than encounter. We ask God for what we think we need or what we and some of that is obvious, you know, if we're sick and we pray for healing. And I, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I'm saying sometimes our prayers fall short because we could get what we ask for, we can get an answer to our prayer without encountering God. We can experience his power as the man did at the pool of Bethesda and, and have no clue who it is. And obviously, as believers, we give Jesus credit, but at the same time, God wants much more in relationship with us. And, and that's kind of difficult because most of us don't live with much margin. We don't need more. We actually need less. And, and so that we can have more room for freedom and relationship and whatever. Sometimes we're in a place where emotionally we don't have any more to give. And we, we struggle with those dynamics thinking, but it, it requires more. And so we said, um, was it last year? Uh, we did this series on making room. Uh, and, and the big idea with that series was we can't make God move, but we can make room for God to move. And so when we do that, God always fills that void. All right, so with that in mind, encountering God, not just experiencing him, is the place of transformation. That's the big idea we're, we're working toward. So let's see the account here in John chapter 5. Uh, we'll read the first 15 verses, I think it is. It's from the NIV. Um, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem uh, for one of the Jewish festivals now there was in Jerusalem near the sheep gate, sheep gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, or uh, some translations say Bethsaida, um, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. 38 years. How many of you are older than 38? Okay. He'd been sick longer than you've been alive. Okay. If you're under that. So, so understanding, dealing, we're talking long-term situation here. 
when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time. Notice Jesus' perception. And we have a tendency to kind of skip over that. I'm sure the man had a record of that. In fact, he rehearses it. And the Lord encounters him in that place and Jesus sees him lying there, learns that he'd been in this condition for a long time. He asked the man, do you want to get well? Now that's kind of a confrontational question. I mean, you could ask it in a kind way. It's one of those, have you ever been in a situation where somebody asks you something and then later you think, what did they really mean by that? I mean, on the other hand, you're like, I'm, I'm doing everything I know to do. I've been laying here for 38 years trying to get well. What do you mean, do I want to get well? And sometimes the Lord asks you a question, not because he's looking for answers or information. He already knew. It's that question that draws you to the place of encounter. The man politely said, sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. Watch this. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But the man replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up your mat and walk? The man who had, was healed had no idea who it was. For Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Anybody ever feel like in the process of our experiences with the power of God that from time to time, he leaves us hanging. See, the man had an experience with the power of God, but he had no idea who spoke to him and what he had received. Obviously, some of that, he, he received healing in his legs or strength enough to carry a mat, however much that would be. But through the years, I'm sure there'd be significant deterioration of your muscle structure if you can't walk and you're just lying around. So part of that's a realization of the healing that he'd received. Instantly, he's walking, but it's kind of like the man that was healed in Acts chapter 3, uh, or, uh, yeah, Acts chapter three at the gate and he goes running and leaping and praising God. And then when he comes into the temple, he's holding on to Paul and they're holding on to him. It's like, if you're really healed, why you still got to hold on? Why can't you? So that aspect of us realizing the power of God. And then when he, when he realizes, wait a minute, I, I was, I had an experience with this power, but I don't, I don't even know who the guy was. So, so he had no idea who it was. Jesus slipped away into the crowd. You ever feel like that? Man, we're close. We have this encounter or this experience with God and his power. And then, have you ever prayed boldly and then followed that with a prayer of, uh, God, where are you? See, and I love the fact that the scripture is just so obvious with that. 38 years, boom, he's healed. And he doesn't get offended of the question or, or how the confrontation takes place. He just receives, but he has no idea what he received or who he received it from, but he's in trouble with the Pharisees. So, yeah, amen. Way to go, Hardy. Later, Jesus found him, watch this. 
He said, I have no idea who it was. Jesus slipped away into the crowd, but then he comes back. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Now, it's not the same with the religious confrontation and this legalistic approach, whatever. What I want you to see is he wasn't saved. He didn't know God. He was still sinning, but he experienced the power of God. The goal of Jesus encountering that man face to face was not just to get his legs working again. The goal of Jesus encountering any of us is to make us like him. But if we don't let those experiences bring us into this true encounter with the person of Christ and transform us into his image and likeness, that is the ultimate goal. And so when I say sometimes we can misunderstand the focus of our prayer, and I don't know how often this guy obviously had some envy and some jealousy issues because other people took his healing, if you will. They believed that an angel came down and stirred the waters, and whenever those waters were stirred, the first one in. You ever feel like you're second or third or fourth right. or you don't matter? And then it's the self-pity that kicks in. I don't have anybody to help me. Here I've been laying here 38 years and nobody will help me. Well, help has arrived and you have no idea his name is Jesus. And sometimes our expectation of who can help us, how they need to help us, or why they need to help us can, can just be distractions from us getting the heart of God and responding to his invitation to step in to that place of transformation. Then Jesus turns his attention from the man after he encourages him, listen, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Then he turns his attention to the Pharisees and they get into this intense debate back and forth and they get offended that Jesus is processing with them that, that he's the healer and he hears from the Father. Uh, here's the big idea. The purpose of the display of God's power is to produce in us the image of Christ. The purpose of the display of God's power at any level is to produce in us the image of Christ, not just an intended result. God can do anything, but we don't necessarily draw closer to him because of what he does what we need to draw closer to him for is because of who he is. And we can see God's power displayed and never see his heart revealed if we don't press in to know him. And that's what the father wants. Second Corinthians chapter three. Let's look at this for a minute and then we'll put this, activate this in prayer for a few minutes. Second Corinthians three, here the scripture says, therefore, since we have such a hope, and context, Paul has been writing about the hope uh, that we have, uh, the glory uh, that we have that is not fading. And the glory that Moses beheld was fading away. But we have uh, a, a hope of this greater lasting glory. So to put it in context. Therefore, since we have such a hope of greater glory, we are very bold. Underline it. We who have this hope in God's greater glory that's not fading away, but that lasts are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, or the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, the writings of Moses, the law, or whatever you want to call it, a veil covers their hearts. Notice it's not only in their minds, but the veil covers their hearts as well. Place of uh, knowledge and understanding made dull through the law and, and not being able to see that as a pointing to Christ, 
and the place of relationship from our hearts is made dull so that we can see the display of God's power in the Old Testament, but still respond to that in fear like the Israelites did of, we we don't want to see that anymore. You scare us. And we're we're afraid that if you continue to do that, we can't control it and it will kill us, which is exactly true. And so that's why Christ presents us the cross. And Paul said, we're to pick up our cross daily and follow Christ. We're to die to ourselves daily so the cross won't kill us. Amen. Little, little shallow, surfacy tidbit for you on a Wednesday night. All right. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers her heart. Verse 16. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord... The veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate, uh, some translations say behold or reflect the glory of God. We with unveiled faces, no, no filters, no veils, no nothing between us and God, face to face as we behold or contemplate or reflect the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. Okay, here's, here's a last big idea I want to give you here. here here's my summation of what we just read. I encourage you to go back and read that through several times and process it. But here's the, here's the deal. The degree to which we see the face of God in the glory of Christ is the degree which, uh, to which boldness and freedom are released for our transformation. Listen to it. Think about it one more time. The degree to which we see the face of God in the glory of Christ is the degree to which boldness and freedom are released in us for transformation. What did Paul say? With unveiled faces, okay, no no filters, nothing hindering it, face to face, wide open. All of us, and we get to behold all of him. And that happens by the power of the Spirit working in us. This glory uh, is what begins to transform us, and it comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. He said, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom to do what? Freedom to, to receive everything God wants us to receive, his power, his strength as the man at the pool of Bethesda, healing. But it's not just so our legs will work and our heart will still miss it. It's so that we can be totally transformed into the image of Christ. And so that happens, starts on the inside, but it manifests toward the outside as well. And so again, going back to verse 12, he said, that hope of us experiencing the glory of God is what makes us very bold. As we go into a prayer time here over these last few minutes, what I want to challenge you with is this thought. Just like the man at the pool of Bethesda laid there for 38 years and had very legitimate excuses why he wasn't healed, according to him. What, what he really did was misplace his hope of healing. And what Jesus did was to confront that with a simple question, do you want to get well? Notice he didn't ask him, do you want to get in the pool? Because he would have just fostered that false hope of, if I just get in the water, 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 Healing's not in the water, healing's in the name of Christ. And so when he confronts him with that, it's that legitimate deal because sometimes we go so long with unanswered prayer 
we lose our passion and our boldness to pray the prayer. We can still go through the motions, but we really don't believe it's going to happen. And so here, God stirs us up with this boldness, and Paul emphasizes it. We're very bold because of the hope that there is in the glory of God in the face of Christ. And when we take the veils off and stop hiding because things are passing away, our faith is weakening, our strength to hold on, our uh, boldness in prayer is waning a little bit and, and we're, we're hurting and we're wounded and we're, we're doubts creeping in and whatever it might be. Our minds are made dull, our, our veil covers our heart and we're just kind of hiding behind the curtains spiritually. Does that describe, it's described seasons of my life. And part of that comes back to what Jesus later comes and, and finds the man and says, hey, stop sinning. Now, now the deal wasn't that Jesus was nitpicking and, and saying you're gonna lose your healing or, or there's gonna be a curse come on your life. What Jesus was communicating by that is all sin is death. Something worse, you think, how much worse could it be? I was an invalid for 38 years. I'm, I'm going to live 40 more in a worse condition? Yeah, it's called death. And that sin will rot you on the inside and destroy your whole perspective. Think of the compassion that Jesus not only encountered this guy, but he went looking for him after he had had an experience so that he could have an encounter. And the awesome thing is, that that's exactly what the Holy Spirit does for us. That many of us have had experiences and haven't fully understood the glory of God, the power of God, come into that relationship to maintain that. I think it's Psalm 103 that says, the people of Israel saw what God did. They saw his acts or his actions, but Moses understood his ways. I just want to encourage you tonight, if you're in a hard place or if you've been praying about something that's causing you to struggle, that unanswered prayer is an opportunity for you to encounter God's ways rather than just see his actions. Let me put it this way. Unanswered prayer is an opportunity for you to encounter God's ways rather than just experience his answer or his power. Okay, now we're getting into all kinds of will of God stuff and all of that. I just, Jesus was great at asking questions and not really answering them. I mean, he was the answer, you, you get it? So, so I don't want to frustrate you, but I do want to stir up those questions because God wants us to go deeper and it's not some surfacey thing that, that we pray for encounter. I really want us to. I want us to pray that not just during this series, but in real life, some of us here tonight need a fresh encounter with God. Can you say amen? And, and some of us need to pray in that way that Paul did. I, I pray that the eyes of your heart be enlightened so that you may know the hope to which you were called, the, the, the excellency of his power for all of us who believe, that, that uh, you may have the spirit of wisdom and revelation so you can know Christ better. And not only for our lives, but for other people. And to, to really see that and not say, well, if it's God's will or if it's not God's will or whatever, listen, Jesus demonstrated God's will and the heart of the Father. It's God's will that we be healed. But God's ways of getting that operating in our life, it's easy for us to get healed, but that, that healing doesn't always lead to us having an encounter and being transformed. 
And so what we need to do is in praying for that, ask the Holy Spirit to move in people's lives with that spirit of transformation and that be our goal and our desire. To be conformed or transformed to the image of Christ. That when people see us, obviously they recognize us from our facial features or our voices or whatever level of relationship they have, but praying that we become more and more like Christ and so when they encounter us, they see him. That's when we know transformation is working on the inside. Can you say amen? amen? Okay, good stuff. You received the word of the Lord. All right, here's what I want us to do. Uh, I want us to pray tonight, just these last few minutes, uh, some body prayer, and that be for us as well. If, if you're here tonight and you're just in a place of saying, man, I really need the touch of God. Maybe it's a veil that God's helped you see over your heart, kind of hiding instead of really boldly pressing into to relationship. There's a lot of things that could cause us to do that. And, and I certainly don't speak that with any sense of shame or condemnation because there isn't any in Christ. But it can be that place of intimidation where God's glory is here or we get stuck in the past of what we used to do and how close we used to be and how intimate our prayer time was or whatever. And then we can go through a dry season and we can get weary in well-doing, even though the scripture says not to. And what God means for life, the enemy can twist and use for condemnation. He knows the word too. He just doesn't use it in the same way that Jesus did. He comes only for to steal, kill, and destroy. And so he wants to put veils on our minds and veils over our hearts so that we got a place to hide like Adam and Eve did rather than a place to experience God's glory like they did before sin entered in. And then let God come and instead of a place of hiding, make a place of covering so that we can begin to walk in confidence and relationship with him again. So uh, I want us to pray over our body tonight in agreement and uh, some small groups here wants to pray for Daryl, that God complete that healing in him and uh, that work of transformation. Want us to pray uh, for Joffrey, complete healing there. And then if there are other needs that I may have overlooked in our body, I uh, want you to pray over those in your groups. And then particularly, I want us to pray that every person have a personal encounter. And, and not challenge you, I want to encourage you. If you're in that place where maybe it's unanswered prayer or just a place of struggling in that relationship and it's like, man, I don't know if I, if I have that to give or, or, or to press through. If we'll make that effort to, to, to press past uh, in athletics, they call it the pain threshold. That, that you come to this place and even the best athletes, the best trained athletes still experience that. Kim frequently reminds me that that's why she doesn't do it. If I don't, if I don't, if I don't go through the, if I don't run that far, I don't experience the pain and I don't have to press through the pain threshold to experience the runner's high. And she frequently reminds me of that. I've never experienced that high. She's never been high much in her life, but particularly a runner's high. Are you with me here? Okay, but it takes courage to press past the pain threshold to see the glory on the other side. And when we understand that spiritually, it's not the pain that we're expecting or anticipating, it's the pain of dying to ourselves to let God fully work in us. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for that tonight. I thank you for every heart. I thank you for those that are here, Lord, to hear your word. I thank you for those that'll uh, tune in and experience that online and through, through whatever means. And I pray, Father, tonight for the return, 
that you have declared that your word will not be empty or void. And just like you spoke into the emptiness and the darkness and filled it with form and life and light, Lord, I pray that the entrance of your word into our lives tonight do the exact same thing. That it bring to light the glory of God in the face of Christ and the power of transformation who comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Holy Spirit, I ask you to take that word tonight and breathe it into us and help us define those areas of our life where you want to bring fulfillment where you want to bring form and structure to the chaos, where you want to bring light into the darkness and recreate the image of Christ in us and transform and continue that work of transformation. I love the fact that it says we are being transformed, not have been. It's an ongoing work. It's this relationship that God's doing in us. So if you need that tonight personally, right where you are, whatever that means to you, I just want you to lift your hands to the Lord right there where you sit. Come on, just in a place of agreement in life tonight. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for that connection. Holy Spirit, I pray that you do a unique work in every heart and life as we just look to you, as we release our faith, Lord, in those areas of our life tonight where we need the transforming work of God. There's a, a, a transforming work where the image of God is made more visible and real so that we can come into that place of pursuit. We can press past where we are into that place you need us to be. Thank you for it. Hallelujah. Father, we pray for those in our body tonight. Why don't you just reach over and take hands with the person beside you there, around you. Jesus, we just pray in agreement. We thank you for your protection, your healing over Joffrey. And uh, Lord, over all in our body, pray that you just continue that work and bring people to mind, Lord, that we just need to speak a word of prayer, release our faith on their behalf, pray one for another and just walk in obedience to that which you've commanded tonight. Lord, we pray over Daryl and that you just complete the work that you've begun, your promises, that he who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. Lord, I thank you that it's not this distant connect like we read in this story tonight. We know exactly who our healer and our deliverer is. We thank you for the uh, work that was already done. And Lord, that the blood clots and all of that process, uh, nothing is wasted in God. And so, Lord, we thank you for it. We give you praise and glory. Thank you for the work you've done in our lives and the work you're continuing to do in this body tonight. And Lord, I pray that it would not only be in the ways of healing, but it would be in those works of restoration on the inside of us that the Holy Spirit wants to do. We thank you for it and we give you praise and glory here tonight. Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hey, everybody, would you stand together? And uh, would you just spend these last few minutes here? Let's just connect in prayers of agreement. If there's needs that you wanna share, uh, things that you wanna uh, express. You can certainly take a minute to do that. If not, let's just bless one another in prayer and, and just really release that in body ministry, particularly in prayer tonight. Can we just have some uh, small groups there and link up with some folks? And let's just finish as we pray together. <clears throat>